All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to turn things over to Jen, Ebony, and Victoria from World Education and let them uh, start us off. This is Jen Vanek. Um, direct, I'm Director of Digital Learning and Research from the EdTech Center at World Ed. Um, welcome to our April webinar. As you know, we've been working with ProLiteracy for some months now, um, collaborating, collaborating in bringing our networks together to help everyone push their skills in delivering um, remote instruction and distance education. And um, so let's turn it over to Ebony, who will give you um, some tips on engagement during this webinar. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Zoom, you can find the control panel at the bottom of the screen. When you use the chat, please select um, all panelists and attendees so that way your comments can be seen by everyone. To use the hand raise feature, you can find that underneath the participant list and we'll ask you to use the hand raise feature if you need technical assistance and I don't see your comment in the chat. Please use the Q&A feature for all content related questions. And you can find that in the control panel as well. And if you have any other issues, please contact me at the email address you see in the last box. Thank you. Thanks, Ebony. So just a few reminders, we will, actually we are recording this, um, and we will be sending you a list of all the websites, resources, and everything else that um, we are presented today, including a link that will get you to the slides, um, a transcript of the chat, the Q&A, and always a certificate for participation will be coming to you. So let's uh, move on to the agenda today, and you'll We'll talk a little bit about what, what you're going to hear. Um, so this is a super exciting presentation um, called The Seven Elements of Highly Effective Remote and Hybrid Instruction. And we are so lucky to have Cynthia Bell and Nell Eckersley from the Literacy Assistance Center of New York City. Um, th this is work like no other work I know of going on in, um, in, in the area of technology-rich um, support and instruction for adult basic ed students. Um, and just can't, cannot wait for this presentation. So after, after, the, the, after the presentation, Todd is gonna be making sure that all of the questions that you post in the Q&A get responded to, um, actually in the Q&A or the chat. And um, as always, we'll keep this open as long as until all of the questions are, are answered. So with that, uh, let's turn it over to Nell and Cynthia. Hi, everybody. So good to be here. Happy Friday. This is Nell. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and bring up our presentation. Uh, um, hello, everyone. This is Cynthia. I would like to say happy Friday to everyone as well. Excellent. Um, so yes, we are here to talk about seven elements for highly effective remote and hybrid instruction. Um, Cynthia and I are both in our own home offices, so we're not together right now, but we've done this session um, at COAB and we've been working on this concept for a while. Um, so we will talk more about that as we go through the session. Um, we are going to share all our materials in this Padlet. Um, I don't know, is that something that Todd, you could put back into the chat? Oh, so this is a Padlet that has this presentation in it, but it also has some activities that we're going to get you to, and it's just helpful sometimes to have everyone. Yes, the Padlet. I can uh, put that in. Thank I just you dropped so it in the chat. Oh, you thank did? You. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so yes, we're using Padlet as a way to get you to everything, and that way you just need one link and hopefully you have access to everything. Um, so we did want to talk a little bit about ourselves, uh, just to introduce ourselves a little bit more. Cynthia, do you want to start us off and give the directions? Sure. So we're going to play Two Truths and One Lie as a little bit of an icebreaker and an introduction for ourselves. I'm Cynthia Bell. I'm the one on the left. Um, and these are my three statements. So what you can do is um, uh, type in the chat box which number you think is the statement that is the lie. So the three statements that I have are I have three older siblings. My favorite color is purple. And I am from Hawaii. So Type in the chat box, which one you think is the lie? Two of them are true and one of them is not. I like how um, somebody put in there um, a comment, like 
they, they are 100% sure. They didn't even just write the number. They said, you are the oldest. <laughs> They're like facts. Okay. Um, 25 new messages. So we got a lot of threes. We got a lot of twos. We got a lot of ones. It's really hard when there's so many coming in. Oh, well, someone said it's obvious, but that's because he's played this game with me before. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's not fair. Uh, four unknown was not one of the options. Okay, so the two truths and one lie. Uh, I do have three older siblings. I actually am the baby. A lot of people think that I'm the oldest. I, I don't know why. Maybe, you know, because I'm bossy. I don't know. That's what my kids would say. Um, I have strong leadership capabilities instead of bossy. I am the baby, though. I do have three older siblings. Uh, the lie is number two. My favorite color is not purple. My favorite color is lavender. So that is the lie. And I am from Hawaii. I'm a military brat. I was born on the island of Oahu at a Navy hospital in Honolulu. So number two is the lie. That's a little bit about me. Nell, let's do you. Yes. So we, um, so yes, my name's Nell and I, my truths and lies are one, I tried out for twice for roller derby. Two, I'm from England originally. And three, I don't know how to drive. So which is the lie? One, two, or three? And I actually can't. Let me see if I can get the chat to show up for me. It's not showing up for me. So you're going to have to look, Cynthia, and tell me what you think people are saying. Got you. There are a lot of threes. Oh. Of twos. I'm not seeing a lot of ones. So I guess a lot of people feel confident <clears throat> people about that I, We live in New York City, but I guess maybe it's not obvious. Anyway, okay, so um, it, I did try out for roller derby twice, didn't get on the team. I am actually originally from England, but I do know how to drive. But in, in New York, it's possible not to. I, I realized maybe I need to do a different lie outside of the city because it's funny to me. I, I grew up mostly in Nebraska and I did learn to drive rather late. I was like 24 or something, which is very unusual in Nebraska. But in New York, you could, you could live your whole life and never drive. Anyway, that was a little bit about us. We, you know, we think that having... Uh, an, an opportunity for you also to get to know us, but even to do this with students is a really great um, icebreaker uh, and you get to um, perfect your lies. Because no, it wasn't clear which one was the lie. Someone oh, asked, sorry. so they're all true? So they're all true? <laughs> no, so number three is, is not true. I do know how to drive. How to drive. So number right. three says I don't know how to drive, I do. I, and uh, I now live in deepest Queens where actually I do drive, which that was not true for many years in New York, but anyway. All right, moving on. And notice a lavender car to deal with both of our lives. Um, so we are gonna talk today about remote and hybrid instruction and your practice, what you're already doing. We know that everyone had to do this sort of emergency move over to remote instruction. And now you're probably maybe already in the middle of doing hybrid or, or at least sort of trying to consider how that might be something you can do. Um, so when we, when we made when we came up with these seven elements, it was really in the height of um, pandemic instruction, um, but we, we were really kind of excited to see how people can take what worked for them uh, during pandemic times into life, hopefully after pandemic times, uh, and keeping you know, the things that worked well or thinking about how they need to shift a little bit to do it in a hybrid, hybrid way. Um, so we're going to look, look at what you're already doing. We're going to look at, at the seven elements that we've kind of developed to help make it a little bit more concrete. And then we're gonna talk about determining the right technology tool for the job that you want it to do. Cause this is one of those things where technology is not always the answer and certainly not every tool does the same thing for everybody. So we, we wanna spend a little bit of time being thoughtful about that. Cynthia, and, you wanna talk about Yep, I'll cover the objectives. So we just have three objectives today. Uh, we're gonna obviously deconstruct the elements and how they relate to your current practice. So we're gonna make sure that everybody has opportunity to reflect on what they're currently doing, uh, discuss learning goals and how the elements and tools reinforce those goals. And lastly, engage in a task that models the implementation of the elements and the use of the tools. Typically when we do this, we try to model more than one task, but we only have a certain amount of time. So we're only gonna get the opportunity to engage in one. However, there will be, um, what's what I'm looking for? You could say subliminal, or implicit, the, ta uh, the elements will actually be engaged in implicitly throughout the session that we're doing today, but we will have time to do one specific task. Excellent. Oh, my things always change. Okay, um, so we have, uh, to start us off, we have a little practice survey to find, or a, 
your practice survey to find out a little bit about what you are doing or have been doing. Uh, we're using Mentimeter for this. So the way to get to our survey, one way is to go on your phone or on your computer, however you want to do it, to www.menti.com and put in our code. Um, or you can scan this QR code. This is a mobile friendly activity. And I also, I, let's see, let me see if I can put it in the chat. I already you. dropped the link in the chat. I got you. <laughs> You're so good. I love working with Cynthia. Okay, so I'm going to, oops, sorry. Let me escape out of that for a second and take us over to our, there we go. So we're getting some good answers in here. So um, this was a question about what platform or tool do you use for your students to access your instructional materials, assignments, and activities? Uh, and we gave you some options, Google Classroom, Canvas, Padlet, email, WhatsApp, and other. Other is interesting. So if you, if you selected other, we'd love to hear about that in the chat. Um, it does look like email is a big one. It's getting bigger. Uh, Google Classroom's also got some votes there. Uh, so you can keep, um, we'll give you another minute or so to answer this one. We're going to move on to our next question. But do feel free to give more information in the chat if you have something else you want to share. All right, I'm going to move on to our next slide. So the question here is, how do you incorporate an interactivity and collaboration? And the options we're giving you are Google Docs, Google Slides, Padlet, Jamboard, and other. And people jumped on that other. So again, please share that in the chat. We love to know uh, the other tools people are using for this. So our first one was sort of organizing all your materials and sharing them. And this one's about having interactivity and collaboration. And as you know, today we're sharing everything with you on our Padlet. So that's kind of, it's not necessarily an interactive. It's actually our answer for the last one, I guess. Wow, lots of other. I'm very excited to see what these others are. All right, I'm going to move us on to the next one. You can keep voting um, on that one, but I'm going to move us to the next question. So when you teach online, what whiteboard, if any, do you use? And we asked, we gave you the options of a whiteboard in the video conferencing platform. So example, Zoom has a whiteboard. Jamboard, which is a Google whiteboard. A real whiteboard that is that my camera focuses on. A piece of paper that I put up to the camera. And I don't use a whiteboard in my instruction. And we see a lot of people are using whatever's built into their video platform. Exciting. We've certainly seen a huge variety of, of things people are using for this particular one. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next one. Um, so how do you assess learner understanding? Check the one that you predominantly use. And we give you exit tickets that they email in, a Google form, worksheets that are submitted, I ask if everyone understands, Kahoot, Quizlet, or other. And again, if you're putting in other, please do share in the chat because I, I can see we got lots of others. It's hard. It's always hard to choose which ones to give you and then we have to have that other category. So it's very interesting for us to see what you're, what you're using. And we've heard teachers really struggling with assessment. I think we, at least in New York City, um, assessment's often not something we talk enough about. There's a tendency to think that assessment is really just that pre and post test. And then you're doing things in your class to kind of make sure things are moving along, but there's not like a real clear sense of, of assessment. And I think that's an area we, Cynthia and I were just talking about maybe doing some more work on because I think it is a challenge uh, for teachers. It's not, not always part of adult ed. Okay, moving on to the next one. So we, we had more other than anything else there. So I'm, I am excited to see the chat for that one. Oh, so it's not going to show you the image very well here. Okay, so this is going to be a little confusing because we, we haven't shared with you what the elements are yet, but I can tell you, um, I don't know why that image didn't come up better. Um, let me share back to this picture. So these, we'll, we're going to go into depth on this. This is really just to find out from you what you already think you're using. So learning management system, video conferencing platform, interactivity, feedback, content, whiteboard, and assessment are the elements. And if you can grab one of those, 
<clears throat> so now if you um, type in, which elements do you plan to use digitally once you go back to in-person instruction? So right now you might be doing all of these or some of these using a digital tool. Um, and maybe before pandemic times, you did these things without using much technology. So we're kind of interested to see what from having this experience of having to use digital tools, you are more interested or more excited or planning uh, to bring with you into your in-person classes. Yay, I see lots of content, interactivity, feedback are big ones here. They seem to be- Now, just to let you know that um, as um, someone who's participating in the Mentimeter, we actually can see the graphic of all, seven, of all seven elements, by the way. Oh, you can, that's good. I don't know why it's coming up my way. Can you see the rest of the screen? Uh, the oh, word cloud, okay. no, but we can when we look at your screen. Okay, that's funny. So I think it's reversed for me. So when I do the S, you get the, the yes. element. And now if I do it this way, you get to see. So anyway, it is uh, interactivity assessment and feedback and content are definitely the main categories. Excellent, so we'll keep coming back. We can look at that again as we need it. But um, so that, that kind of gives you a sense of what we're looking at today um, as our seven elements. That was sort of throwing you into the river. Um, so do you want to talk about this, Cynthia? Sure. So um, the seven elements, oh, here's a little bit of context uh, about where the seven elements came from. So just like most of you all, we were all kind of thrown into the fire in March of 2021. Uh, and Nell and I, along with our colleagues, we, we do professional development and coaching um, for teachers and programs throughout New York City. Um, and there was a lot of, oh, use this tool, use that tool. Should I use Zoom? Should I use Jamboard? Should I use Google Classroom? Should I use? And there was a lot of um, focus on tools and it felt like really overwhelming as to what we should be doing and how we should be teaching. Um, so what we, what we thought about was, let's just go back to what we already know. What is good teaching? Good teaching shouldn't change just because you're now teaching online. Um, so we started to think about what were the essential elements for effective instruction um, and then narrowing that down to seven elements that can translate and should translate when you're teaching online. Uh, just to make it a little bit easier for us as instructors and as practitioners to focus on good and effective instruction rather than just using a tool for tool's sake. Um, and that made it a lot easier for our programs and for our teachers to focus on how they provided their instruction, how they engage their students with instruction online, and it connected to in-person instruction. Um, we also spent some time, I spent some time researching uh, best practices because although the world kind of shifted to online in March of 2021, online teaching and instruction has been happening for years before there was ever a thing called COVID-19. Um, and so there was already a lot of research done out there in regards to effective practices for online teaching and learning. Uh, so I spent a significant amount of time reading that research and disseminating through that research and, and trying to find what things were applicable for adult education and for our teachers and practitioners. Uh, and we narrowed it down to three practices. And those three practices are strive for presence, so whatever it is that you do, you want to strive for presence. Two, interactivity is key. Um, and three, let the students do the work. So each one of these practices is what all of our PD and technical assistance has been around, helping practitioners and instructors focus on making sure that they are implementing these practices with the seven elements in mind, right? So when I'm developing assessment, I need to be thinking about making sure the students do the work. When I'm designing my learning management system, I need to be striving for presence. You wanna consistently strive for presence whenever you're doing online instruction. Uh, you wanna consistently make sure that interactivity is always consistently happening, whether interactivity amongst the students collaboratively or interactivity with you and the students. And then most importantly, let the students do the work. Unfortunately, online instruction tends to be very lecture heavy um, and it, we, we as practitioners can sometimes fall into we're doing the work, we're doing the thinking, and everyone else is just watching. So these are the three practices that actually came out of a lot of research, um, PhD, thesis, and all of those things done from people who have been teaching online 
for years prior to 2021. And so we came up with these seven elements to help our practitioners focus so they're not all over the place about what is effective instruction and applying those elements when we engage in those practices. Cynthia, you keep saying 2021 and it's funny because that's totally right. 2020. 2020. <laughs> the joke is about COVID times, like it just doesn't exist, right? There's <laughs> so we have questions in the chat about what does I see the presence mean? Gotcha. Um, I can answer that one. Actually, we, I, we spent the most time helping instructors with strive for presence. There are actually three aspects of presence. You have cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. And so you want to actually help to, you want to strive for all three of those presence. So for example, um, even the way down to how I do my Google Slides, I use my Bitmojis or I use avatars on my Google Slides because that's a way of making sure that my students still see me. Uh, social presence, um, I, I give students and participants a chance for them to share about themselves. If we were in the physical space, that's a lot easier to do for me to start to know, oh, this kind of person likes this because they always wear this. This kind of person tends to sit here in the classroom, which lets me know that they don't like to be in the front or they're shy. So giving the students opportunity for them to still uh, have that presence known, making ways for them to share more about them and also about you, right? So, you know, even you guys will see as we go through the presentation, even down to the GIFs that I use. I like to use GIFs about sports or Doctor Who or Star Wars because that's how I let my students know more about me. So you have different forms of presence that you want to try to strive for. Uh, you don't want it to just be this two-dimensional thing and all they see is that picture of you and they know nothing about you, they know nothing about each other. Um, and as well as teaching presence, you wanna try and make sure that there are always opportunities for them to teach themselves, for them to teach each other as well as how you teach them. So strive for presence. We don't, we don't have a lot of time to get into it right now. So I'm, that's kind of like the biggest overview. There are three kinds of presence that you want to strive for according to the research, cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. Excellent. There we go. Go ahead, Nell. All right, so again, these are our seven elements. Um, and we're spending more time on the elements today than those practices, but the practices are definitely there. So definitely add, you know, if you have more questions, put them in the Q&A and we can talk more about them. But most of the session is really about the seven elements. Um, so learning management system, video conferencing platform, interactivity, feedback, content, whiteboard, and assessment. When we think about bringing them into our world with hybrid instruction, and hybrid's an interesting term. So um we are imagining a time so in new york state for example in new york city we were given permission to do to i think it was march 20th we were given permission to start doing instruction on remotely right so we've, we've been calling it remote instruction um, in our state we had distance learning as a concept but that was not available to all the funded programs so you only a, a small portion of the programs could do distance learning before pandemic times when when our uh, this memo came down that said you could do uh, remote instruction, it really opened it up to all programs and it also took off certain things. We were not doing um, the usual pre and post testing because we didn't have an online, we weren't using the online test for that. We were not um, entering the data into our regular data system. Um, a lot of things sort of shifted. So while our funders saw that we could continue to provide services to our students, they really took away a lot of the um, tracking and things that they normally did. Um, and as we, we move forward, there, 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 there's going to be a day when that's going to change and we're going to have to sort of return. And so there's slowly, um, we've been getting directives from our, from our state ed department where we now start need to put the data back in the data system and maybe we have to start doing in-person testing um, even before we start doing in-person instruction. And the big question is once we go back to in-person and there's lots of things that are gonna happen between now and then, I think. I mean, for our agency, certainly there's lots of questions about how do you move from where we are today to actually being in person. But once you're in person and what we can start to think about and some of you might already be doing is what are we bringing from this time where we were almost entirely remote or, or entirely remote to a time when we will be meeting face-to-face -face with our students um, so this is not the idea. So I know in our state, again, we have people who are interested in, in continuing to offer remote classes for some students. So for some students, the remote instruction has worked really well and it's enabled them to participate when they couldn't normally do that for whatever reason. 
that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is the idea that there is a face-to-face -face component, an in-person component, but now there's also a component of um, digital access. And that could be that a class meets only twice a week and now there's some instruction synchronous or asynchronous um, online, or it could be all the way just to my, my regular class schedule like I always had in person, but I want to bring the learning management system with me because I found it really useful. My students seem to be very happy to access all of our content there, or I wanna be able to meet with my students you know, via video once, you know, with, make an appointment with each student once a semester or something like that. So what are the components? So here's one, you know, one way to, to break it up is that we have our in-person uh, instruction, we're going to have our virtual instruction, and it's going to be synchronous or asynchronous, and somewhere in the middle there's the hybrid piece. Um, and then another kind of image, the same idea, is that you have your in-person and your remote, and what so in-person sort of pre-pandemic, remote is what was pandemic, what is your hybrid gonna be? Where, what components of these elements? So the elements that we are talking about today, as Cynthia said, they came from thinking about how we have always, what is good teaching, regardless of whether it's online or not. Uh, so in-person or online, we, we need to in, use these elements, but which parts of them will be digital, how we will incorporate them will shift over time. But, and as you, added into the Mentimeter, the things that you, you've already thought about possibly bringing over, the ones that really stood out to you that worked really well. I know, again, in New York City, we have a lot of folks who would be very willing to maybe do some of their homework or do some reading on their phones as they're waiting for the subway or taking a bus or whatever. That might not be true in another community or with another class. Um, so that's kind of what we're getting at today. So again, the seven elements came from good teaching in general with a with a new view to how can we bring that to the remote time. And now we're beginning to think again, what can we take from this experience in remote instruction and bring back to our in-person instruction? Cynthia. Okay, my turn. Um, so we're bit down to our second objective now, uh, which was to talk about the learning goals. So we have the seven elements. Uh, if you don't mind going back to slide eight for a second now. So we have the cells and elements, uh, that's slide seven, right there, uh, learning management system, right? So um, are you, we, we did the Mentimeter, learning management system is basically this thing that you're using to organize your classroom materials, right? Are you using Google Classroom? Are you using a Padlet? Are you just using a Google Doc where you're always putting the assignments? But the analog to that in person was if I was, if I had a syllabus, I always had a class syllabus. So my students always knew what the work was, when the work was due, et cetera. That's like the equivalent of the learning management system. Uh, the video conferencing platform, are you using Zoom, are you using Google Meets? Where, how are you using to meet and to connect with your students? Uh, number five, I wanted to just add some clarity there. When we talked about content, you know, um, are you teaching math? Are you teaching literacy? Are you teaching ESL, right? And then thinking about how, what tools you're going to use to teach that content, whether it's online or in person. Uh, the whiteboard, we know most of us use whiteboards when we're in person. Likewise, you'd wanna use a whiteboard online for the same reasons, but also for different reasons. Um, and then Nell already mentioned about assessment, formative assessment, as well as summative assessment. Uh, thinking about how you assess and why you assess when you're in person, as well as online. And then most importantly, the feedback. Uh, feedback seemed to happen a lot more organically in person. Uh, it still can happen just as organically online. That feedback needs to be immediate uh, and or it can be delayed there sometimes. But when we were in person, the feedback tended to be immediate. I am a math specialist. So if I'm teaching math and a student raised their hand, I would come over to them in person if we were teaching in person and they'd be able to talk to me, Ms. Bell, this is what I did, here's what I'm doing, here's where I'm stuck, uh, can you help me? That feedback is immediate. That feedback needs to happen in the same way online. So I just wanted to disseminate or uh, not disseminate, to deconstruct these elements a little bit more for us. But the first step when you're thinking about planning your instruction is starting with what's your learning goal? You don't want to just start with, oh, well, today I'm going to teach and I really want to make sure that I focus on assessment. We didn't necessarily do that when we were in person. Uh, you want to start with what is your learning goal, which is not necessarily the same as the objective. 
what is it that I want the students to actually learn today? How am I going to go about providing that opportunity for them to learn that thing today? Whatever the learning goal is, you might have one, you might have two, you might have three. Uh, but starting with your learning goal, uh, next slide now, is important. And then here you want to think about these steps, right? These are the three steps to think about when you're engaging in these seven elements. Start with identifying your learning goal first then determine which element works best for achieving that identified goal, right? So for example, um, I just was planning a math lesson the other day, um, and my learning goals is I really want students to be able to collaboratively work together to build an understanding of the connection between multiplication and the connection of division. Of division. That's my learning goal. I'll say that again. My learning goal is I want students to work together to build an understanding of the connection between multiplication and division. So if that's my learning goal, then I think about what elements are gonna work best for me to achieve that learning goal. Well, if I'm teaching online, I know I'm gonna need a video conferencing platform, but then I said my goal is for them to work collaboratively. So I'm gonna need an element of interactivity. I'm gonna have to think about how they will be able to engage interactively and then um, I said my learning goal was for them to build that connection. So I'm going to have to assess whether or not they were able to build that connection. So the three elements that I'm going to focus on would be I want to make sure I have the proper video conferencing platform. I'm going to make sure that I give proper place for interactivity and that I have obviously my content because it's math and that I have a place for me to formatively assess whether or not they're progressing toward that understanding. So for me, if I were building that lesson, those are the four elements that are gonna be at the forefront of my mind as I plan out the rest of the lesson. So then step three would be to then choose the appropriate tool. So you don't start with a tool. I don't start my lesson saying, I'm gonna use Jamboard today and then force my lesson into Jamboard. No, I start my lesson with, what is my learning goal? Okay, so that's what I want to do. I know I want them to work interactively. I know I want them to build an understanding about multiplication division. So I'm probably gonna end up with two tools. I'm probably gonna end up with Jamboard and Desmos. Desmos is my math content specific tool, which we're actually gonna engage in Desmos later on. It's my math content specific tool. And then I'm going to give them an assignment in Jamboard. So you choose the tool after you start with the learning goal and then after you focus on the element, don't forget it's what we already know good instruction look like, and then you choose the tool. Uh, Nell Eckersley, she's our, I call her our IT, our technology guru. I, I, most of the things I learned about technology I've learned from Nell. And one thing she always says that sticks with me in my head is when it comes to tools, once you have a hammer, then everything feels like a nail. And so we wanna be careful about the tech tools and the ed tech tools that we use we start with that tool, then that's the hammer. And then I'm going to try and make everything that nail. So I'm not going to start with Jamboard. I'm not going to start with Kahoot. I'm not going to start with Zoom. I'm not going to start with whatever tool that I learned about that day. What I am going to start with is my learning goal, then focus on the element of good instruction, and then choose the appropriate tool. So those are the three steps for how to build a lesson or a task. Nell is going to take us a little bit more in depth with the actual, like, what's the term, academic terms of what I just said. Go ahead now. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because really Cynthia, I think just gave you a really a very good example of this, but this is another way to think about the same thing, which is the post method, which was actually developed, I think for marketers, but it, uh, it can be applied to education. And it, again, it's really just emphasizing that you start, I think the objective strategy in technology is really what she just talked about. And it, it just emphasizes again, that you think about the people and you're the people, your students are the people, um, if I'm thinking about one of the struggles I've had, I'm thinking about the whiteboard, right? So when we had our workshops in person, there was a tendency in a workshop that you would write everything up on the whiteboard. Someone asked a question and you would write up the answer or the question up on the board. If you're sharing um, resources, they'd be up on the board. And at the end of the, the workshop, everyone would have to come and take a photograph of the whiteboard, or maybe it was even on chart paper. And I would have to take the chart paper back to my office and type it up and then send it out. And, I'll tell you that took a while before that happened. So there was this delay in getting you the content that we had all developed together. And that's when I realized that that wasn't really working. So my objective, so my people were my people in my workshop. My objective was to get you all the content that we had created together. 
Uh, and my strategy had been that it was on the board and you could take pictures of it. And I realized, what if we had a Google Doc that we actually put our content onto during class? So we were all had a document we could use together. Um, and then you could have that link and just get back to it immediately. And there'll be no delay in you getting the content. Aware. But it took a while for me to figure that out. And that is one of those things that I would take from a pandemic period where we did that probably very naturally uh, and take that back to my hybrid classroom where now we can still write things on the board, but let's, let's think more about how we can maybe take notes together on our devices uh, and then the technology at the end. So, it, and it's, a, it's an iterative process as you, as you think of the technology tools. And I know that can be a real struggle for people feeling like, oh my gosh, there's a, you know, every time I look, there's a new app for that or a new tool and I don't know all of them. Um, but if you, if you start with your people objective and strategy, the technology will be there and you'll, you'll play with it a little bit and then you might need to do some Googling to find something else. And I think there are some great resources out there uh, that the EdTech Center has and other places where you can find sort of compendiums of tools once you know what you're looking for. But the key is the objective, like don't lose track of the objective. And we've seen this a lot with, with people because we get very excited about tools. So we've been very careful so far. We've given you some examples of tools, but we're very careful not to immediately give you a tool to go with each element because it's so quick for us to translate our thoughts then to that tool and not really think about what does the element really mean. So when we were thinking about um, this workshop with you guys, obviously we're in remote time now, but even if we were doing this in person or, or even if it was a combination of in-person and, and online, how would we get the content to you? So kind of what I was just describing, except that was uh, the content we created together. This is more like, how do we get you the resources we want to share with you from today? So this is the Wizard of Oz Greek curtain, and I'm going to whisk it away so you get to see behind the scenes. Um, so again, we thought about the people, right? We assume, we're guessing that most of you are joining us on computers or phones or tablets, uh, and that we knew we were going to be in, pa in Zoom. I'm sorry, this slide, I didn't change, but we were Originally, we did something like this for Koei when we were in a pathable app. So in this case, we knew you'd be in Zoom. We knew it would be a webinar. Uh, so we, you know, we would, that meant that we'd have Q&A available and chat available. Um, our objective was for you to access our materials and know how to get back to them. And knowing how to get back is actually one of the bigger challenges. Uh, and then the strategy was to share a link with you um, and that was probably easy to remember or get back to. So either you could bookmark it or write it down or something like that. So we knew those were our people objectives and strategies. What was a tech tool? So we had a whole bunch of tech tools available to us, right? We knew we could email. We don't really know your email addresses, so we couldn't email you. We knew we would have Zoom chat, which is helpful, but if someone comes in late or, you know, you'd have to remember to kind of grab it from the Zoom chat. Google Slides, we're using Google Slides as our presentation, so that would still require you to somehow get back to our Google Slides. Uh, Google Doc would be another option, Google Classroom, which is kind of a big deal, like we're not going to create a class just for a one-off workshop. Uh, HyperDoc, which is really a version of all of those Google things. Uh, Wakelet, which is very like Padlet. Um, and then website, so we could tell you to go to the LEC website, for example, or or Pro literacy website or something, and then Padlet. And we chose Padlet with the idea that we think most people are familiar with it. We could customize the link so it's kind of memorable. It, had, it was related to today and it had today's date in it. Um, and we thought that that was something both that you could copy and paste somewhere or you could open it. If you have a Padlet account, it would sort of save it there for you. These would all be things I would consider with my students, right? Are we going to use this consistently? Is it worth spending some time on how do you bookmark things or, you know, get a Padlet account so every Padlet we share with you goes there or so these would all be part of the thinking in making the decision. Cynthia? Got it. I was just about to answer someone in the chat box. So if someone wants to respond to Aaron because um, I'm going to do the next part. So we're going to actually do an activity. We have about five, six minutes left. We're going to do an activity, right? Um, so the element that I'm actually going to engage in, and there are two, right, um, is the, a content-specific element, right? So again, math, but don't worry, we're not necessarily going to do math for everybody whose heart stopped for like three seconds just then because I said the word math. Um, and assessment, right? So, and assessment. Because we covered the seven elements today, we also gave you all a chance to reflect a little bit on your practice um, and wh why the elements are necessary for whether you're staying online or you're going to move hybrid. 
So we want to give you a chance to actually engage with one of the recommended tools so you could see how it can be used for at least one of these uh, elements. So again, if I started with my learning goal, my learning goal is to assess, to give you all a chance to check in. That's my learning goal. Um, the other thing that I want to think about is um, our people. We have what? 100 something people here, so I need to get you there quickly. And then my other learning goal is I kind of want to introduce this amazing tool to you that maybe you haven't heard of before. So those are my learning goals. So therefore, I'm going to choose, now next slide please, this tool. Now next slide please. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to choose this tool. This is Desmos. You can type in the chat box yes or no if you've ever actually used Desmos before, whether you've used it as a participant or you've used Desmos as a teacher. I love how someone has a growth mindset. They said, not yet. That's different than no. That means you've got a growth mindset. I love it. So you got a lot of no's. I'm actually going to start to share my screen now. All right, uh, all right. But first, uh, Nell, if you could do it one more slide so that they can get the link. There are a couple of ways you could get to the Desmos. If you have already accessed the Padlet that we shared with you all, you can actually get to the Desmos activity from that Padlet. You can actually click on that Desmos activity link that's on the Padlet, or you can uh, click on the link that I'm gonna drop in the chat box now for you. It's whichever way makes you feel most comfortable. How about that? If, you, if you're like dying to get on there now, you can go ahead and click on it from the Padlet, or you can click on the link in the chat box. When you go to log in, I mean, when you go to access it, it'll ask you, do you want to log in? You do not have to log in. You do not have to create an account. If you already have a Desmos account, I'd suggest logging in um, because logging in allows you to continue your activity, right? So for instance, if you don't log in and you do the activity and you get kicked out of the, your internet goes down or whatever, when you go back in, you'll have to start the activity over. So this is just a quick little check-in because I wanted you all to have a chance to see about this amazing tool. Now I'm going to take the screen from you if you don't mind. Okay, so um, go ahead and go through the four questions. I'm going to give everybody about two to three minutes to go through the four questions, give you a chance to play with Desmos, especially because we had a lot of no's. And then once you're done, uh, just hop back over into our Zoom room because I'm sharing my screen because I want you to see what the back end looks like uh, because there's a lot of elements that I can engage in when I'm using Desmos. Feedback being one of them, assessment being another, interactivity another. So just by using this one tool, I'm going to hit at least four or five of the elements as far as effective instruction is concerned. If you happen to be in the Zoom right room right now, you're looking at my screen, you can see this is live. I've got five people on the first screen. I've got 19 people on the second screen and it's moving. Most of the people are starting to move. Let me anonymize this so that way you all can have your privacy. I did the opposite. It unanonymized. Un oh no, mine says anonymized now because now I have a... Uh... We're seeing all the names. Oh. I'm looking at it. No, these are um, these are mathematician names. Oh, oh, see, I didn't recognize that. When it, when it anonymizes it, it creates names of fat, famous mathematicians. I should have seen the Apollon, Apollon, Apollonius. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right, um, one more minute. We've got about 47, 45 people. Okay. So Desmos is free and it is primarily a math tool, but in this case, you'll see you're using graphs to talk about how you're feeling or what you've just experienced. So it's a really interesting way to even introduce some math topics, but not, you know, by, by kind of fooling people and to think that they're telling you about themselves and then you realize it's math. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm gonna move us on. I see that we have most of us who have answered. Uh, so if you come back to the main room, you'll see that I'm in the, I'm in the Zoom. This is what the teacher dashboard looks like, right? Um, I love this tool because I have the option to pause. So everybody who was working, I just paused you. I need everybody's attention because I need to give you some information, right? And you're not allowed to do anything else anymore. I'm going to unpause it. 
I can also paste you, which helps me with scaffolding, right? Like if I had pasted, I said, I only wanted you to answer the first two questions. I could have pasted for you to only answer the first two questions. I'm not gonna do that because everybody's already answered. I also get the chance to actually like see what everybody said, right? When I clicked on this student, this is the element of feedback right here. I clicked on this particular student. That means I can give immediate feedback to this student. I can type right here and say, oh, I'm glad to hear that you agreed today. Right, that's immediate feedback. So I'm engaging in the element of feedback. I get to have that direct conversation with that student specifically and privately with them. I can also see as a, as a class, I get the overall um, view of what everybody said. So let's see if we looked at number four, I've got a lot of agrees, got a lot of agrees, I got a lot of agrees. I get the overview right there. So as Nell said, I actually use, this is a math, ed tech tool, right? This is designed for math instruction. But as you can see, technically, we didn't do any math, right? I use this to assess. So I was actually engaging in the element of assessment. I use this because I wanted to know how you are doing, right? Like what's going on? Uh, we got a lot of high stress. We got a lot of high stress here. Only six people stress level went down. Congratulations to those six of you. Either those six of you are really positive people who are recognizing today is Friday or those six of you are about to go on vacation. <laughs> Tell us in the chat box. Anyway, uh, but I can see right here, overview as to what everybody said. So I get to see the teacher view. You all get to see what each other said. So it's actually a really great way for me to assess. Now, as Nell said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I don't wanna run out of time. Desmos is a content specific ed tech tool. So anytime I use Desmos, I'm actually engaging in the element of content specific, right? Because it is a math specific tool. However, you don't have to just use it for math. I actually, that's why you said, think about the element you wanna engage in first. I wanted to assess. So then I had to think about what tool would be good for me to do that assessment. I could have done a Google quiz. I mean, I could have done a Google form. I could have done a Kahoot. I could have done a Mentimeter of a poll. But why did I use Desmos? I used, I used Desmos because one, I wanted to actually engage you all in a content specific tool, give you a chance to play with it. And two, because I wanted to be able to have that overview. As you can see, I could see every single student's response. I could respond back to every single student. So the elements that were in my mind, I'm like, I want feedback, I want assessment, I want content. So then there was only one tool for me to choose, Desmos. That's kind of like that path that you want to think about when you go through those steps. What is it that you want them to learn? What elements do you want to engage in? And then choose the tool. Because as Nell said, there's a lot of ed tech tools out there. Um, but thinking about the elements that you want to engage in because as far as effective instruction and your learning goals should be the catalyst for you choosing which tool that you use. I'm sure we have a lot of questions about Desmos, so I'm gonna try and make sure I answer those when we get to our Q&A time, but I wanted to wrap up uh, this section here regarding assessment, giving you all a chance to think about what you learned today regarding the elements. Uh, Nell, you can pull back up the slides. I'll try and answer the questions as they come in in the chat. As Nell said, Desmos is a completely free tool. All you have to do is create a teacher account in Desmos. Uh, you can use it to teach math, you can use it to teach pretty much anything. Um, you can build activities, you can use activities already there. Any other questions, I'll try and respond to in the chat box. Take it away, now. Excellent, so we're, we're down to like our last slide or two and then it's all you guys asking us questions and we can stay a little over time. Um, so one of the things we wanted to be mindful of is what elements did we actually use today, right? So if we said, what was our learning management system? You can put it in the chat. Our main learning management system, I would say, the way we shared content with you today, because we kind of did it through Zoom a little bit, but I would say it was through Padlet. Um, and then what video conferencing platform? We used Zoom. Um, interactivity, there were a couple of things we used. Um, I think we used chat to start with, Mentimeter, uh, Desmos, I didn't put that in here, but Desmos obviously as well. Um, feedback. Desmos was our primary per, primary function, but again, I think chat could be for any of these things. Um, content, is, it was pro, 
this Desmos we used a little bit. Google Doc, um, we didn't really use Desmos today for content, but Google Doc, so you don't know, but in the, um, if you've been to the Padlet, there is a Google Doc that goes along with this that talks a little bit more about each element and the tools that we su suggest and ways to think about determining which tool you might want to use for which element. Uh, so I should have also included slides there because obviously we, we gave you a lot of content through the slides. Uh, whiteboard, that was Google Slides in the, in the sort of visual way that we use whiteboards. And then assessment was Desmos and chat by just checking in with you and getting your feedback that way. Assessment and feedback can kind of be related that way. Um, so we do, you know, people always ask then what tools do we really recommend? So the ones that we've highlighted here that are actual links are the ones that we, we find really useful, but we recognize that this comes down to you and your people. Like again, New York City, we have a real, our teachers are generally meeting us on their computers, but our students are often coming to class via their phone. So like knowing that would be, would help you decide which tools to use for what. So learning management system, Google Classroom we found very useful. Schoology Canvas, as we've said today, Padlet could totally be that for you. Um, and the idea that it's a place to organize content, but you can get very rich with your learning management system and it can actually build in a lot of these other elements. So feedback can be in there and you know, content obviously can be in there. Um, Zoom, we've been using Zoom the most. We certainly have tried out some of these others and I know Google Meet for one, I know people have, have liked as well, but Zoom seems to be the one that the majority of our folks are using. Interactivity, Padlet, today we used it primarily as a learning management system, but it could have been a space where we would have shared content. The Mentimeter that we use today, we've sometimes done in a, in a Padlet. Um, feedback, we didn't really talk about Cami today, but obviously we use Desmos for feedback today or, or and, yeah and the chat, I think. Uh, content, so Desmos for math, Beeline for literacy, USA Learns for ESL. Again, there's lots of other ones. So there's, we're not saying these are the only ones, but these are the ones that are particularly specialists like the most. Uh, whiteboard, we have Jamboard, uh, an all app, which I'm not sure, they're both uh, free uh, whiteboard apps. Uh, and then assessment, Google Forms, Kahoot, Quizlet. Uh, so those are just some of the tools that are out there. And that is it. That's our contact information. Um, and our Padlet is there once again, but I know it's been in the chat. That's our website. We do have a lot. We've been working a lot on curating playlists uh, with tutorials around a lot of these tools. So if it's something that you're like, I want to know more about Desmos, we have a Desmos playlist. Um, we, yeah, if you're interested in that. So you can go to our website and, and click on our YouTube icon and it will take you to our playlist lists and you can see lots of tutorials that we've curated because there's lots and lots and lots of tutorials out there but some are more useful some are more recent these are the ones that we've found to be very useful so that's that for us i'm going to stop sharing and now's your chance to add questions to the chat or to the q a and thank you nell and cynthia that was a, a fantastic presentation I think we're going to do a little bit different order since we're close to the top of the hour and give folks a chance to type in any questions right now that they may have for the two of you. Please use the Q&A um, uh, feature to type in your questions so that we can track and make sure everybody's questions get answered. And while we're giving folks time to type in their uh, questions, uh, Jen and I will take an opportunity to uh, highlight some of our upcoming uh, webinars from Pro Literacy. We have a couple of uh, series that we've been running. Uh, fundraising in a pandemic, we've already had four webinars. We've got a couple more coming up in May. These help programs kind of get ideas of how to adjust their fundraising uh, efforts um, for kind of the pandemic. And not just kind of doing fundraisers virtually, but also kind of thinking through how to connect your work to uh, funders changing priorities and things like that. And then we're going to have a series of webinars around research. Uh, we have a series of five research briefs that we published. Uh, the three that we're offering in May, you see there on the left, and you can find um, information about these and other webinars at our website, proliteracy.org slash webinars. Jen, you want to talk about what's coming up for the uh, EdTech Center? 
Yeah, we've got um, two things to tell you about. First, on May 14th, we'll have our next Second Friday webinar. Um, as you know, we feature two lightning talks followed by a 30-minute informal Q&A. The two lightning talks will um, be building on innovation for flexible learning spaces. Holly and Fresno Moore and Karen Rivas from Carlos Rosario Adult Public Charter School are going to share resources and experience with human-centered approach to reopening for the next school year. So they're going to be talking about the approach they've used to comb through all their innovation from the, that, that was pushed because of the pandemic and figure out how to create really flexible learning spaces for learners coming up in the next program year. And then we'll have Adam Kiefer from St. Paul Adult Basic Ed Hub Center describing the digital literacy push-in model that he designed and implemented at the Hub Center, um, where he would partner with classroom teachers and their remote instruction in order to support digital literacy that the teachers, skills for, for, for students that teachers could then leverage and use in their in-class instruction. And then, um, so do tune into that. Also note, we, we do still have our Transforming Distance Education course available. It's a free micro learning um, course that's available at the link here. Maybe um, if Ebony, um, or Victoria could chat the links to these things, that'd be great. Um, and then one more opportunity available on the next slide. Um, as you know, um, Jeff Gumis, formerly of CrowdEd Learning, a nonprofit, joined the Ed Tech Center and brought CrowdEd Learning with him. As part of that, we're really leaning into creation and curation of open ed resources so that all teachers have access to quality free digital content to support their instruction. So we are holding an EdTech Makerspace event, which is actually um, a three two hour, or sorry, three three hour opportunities or two three hour opportunities for teachers to get together take the Seattle Digital Equity and Inclusion Framework. It's a wonderful digital literacy framework that, that really supports integration of tech skills. And we're gonna work together to curate and organize and evaluate resources aligned to the competencies in that framework. So um, there is a registration link that you can, um, that Ebony just chatted and, and you can link to on this slide. We hope that you will register and join in this co-creation effort that's going to benefit you personally because you're going to learn some things, valuable information about curation and evaluation of tools, and then also collectively we'll create a body of work that, that can um, provide equitable access to digital literacy instruction for all of our learners together. Um, that, and then we, I, we actually, this, this is on hold where we, we actually, Todd and I just talked this morning and we are leaning toward not having the May 28th webinar because it is, we just realized it's the Friday before, um, Memorial Day weekend. So stay tuned. This date will probably shift to June 4th, but we will confirm that on our websites in the very, very near future. Yep. Plus people deserve a holiday. Yes, you guys have done you. a lot of work this last year. Yes. Okay, so that's it. I think it is time for questions. And I just want to say thanks to Nell and Cynthia, too. This is really great information you shared today. Really well organized and so awesome to demonstrate the, the tools and the, and the approach um, by having everybody use them. Yeah, I do, too. I want to say thank you. And actually, we don't have any questions. Um, I think you guys did a fantastic job kind of covering the content and giving people a lot of uh, resources to think about. And Nell, I did have a question, which was kind of when you look at the objectives and think about your students that you're going to work with, and then you get to the tools and you realize you don't have a tool that to really help you meet that objective to do what you need to do. Where do you go? But it sounds like we can go to your website and find some additional resources or some of the resources you listed there uh, in the slides that we may not be familiar with and kind of test those out. Yes, and you I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll add the link to our, our um, YouTube playlists on the Padlet, so you'll have that. I think, because um, I was thinking about the um, CrowdEd and other tools out there that are kind of these, uh, pulling together of lots of, of uh, different apps and tools out that are available. Um, I know the frustration. So, so my job before pandemic times was to, to do a lot of PD around um, technology. And what I found often with, with 
this is where Cynthia's point about the hammer and the nail came from was that, you know, I would do a workshop called, you know, using Google Slides to make ebooks or something like that. And, and I would have folks come super excited, get very gung ho about it, but then they would kind of look at the whole world as if it could all be um, Google Slide ebooks. And that's really not, you know, it's much more useful if you come to that session knowing that you want to make an ebook because you found that your students would be willing to read something on their phone and you would like to create your content so they could look at it on their phone an ebook then would be really valuable but it it doesn't really work the other way around and that's the struggle because in the moment that you've come up with a problem I and mean, the way that i look at it is if i think about my own growth the places that i've found uh, technology to really help me it's usually to resolve a problem so i'm looking at my instructional process and my routines um, I'm, I'm working with a set of students or teachers in my case, uh, and I look for the places that are not working as well as they could. And I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. I only know that whatever I'm doing, this issue of trying to get materials to people has been a long struggle because a lot of my work is done meeting people only maybe one time in a workshop, uh, certainly not having them consistently over time. And so if I want you to leave with everything that I've created to give you, and not have to make 50 million paper copies or, you know, which again, you're gonna have to go and type in because everything we're doing is kind of around technology. So I, I kind of learned about Bitly to shorten my links to make it a little easier for people to type things in. I learned about QR codes in the same kind of trying to resolve my problem. The big problem there was that people didn't know about QR codes and weren't scanning them. So part of my my session now had to be, how do, how do I teach people to use QR codes? Um, Google was a huge discovery for me, to, the idea of using a Google folder for everything from our workshop. So I give you a link to the Google folder at the beginning of my session. And again, I realized people didn't, didn't know how to get back to that folder, right? So it was all iterative for me. It was all learning, trying something, having parts of it work, having parts of it fail. So now I know I had to take probably the first 10 or 15 minutes to really work with the participants to get them to add the folder to their drive and know how to get back to it. And that felt like a waste, not a waste of my time, but it wasn't what my workshop was about, but it became obvious that that was required. And if I was going to use this technique, it was worth spending some time getting everyone familiar with this and we were going to do it every time they saw me. And now they would hopefully become more familiar with this idea of saving the folder to their drive. So Yes, we definitely have some resources out there. What I can do is add to our Padlet a document that will have some links to kind of compendiums of tools. Um, but again, the most helpful thing is for you to come to that, those lists or those compendia with your struggle, uh, with the challenge that you're faced with and, and try to get as clear as possible, like that post method of like, okay, my people, again, like we said in New York City, almost everybody, I think 90% of our students have been attending class on their phones. That means that you can't, you know, your students can't create Google Slides now because them on their phones, they can't do that, but they can read slides, they can look at slides. So as a teacher, maybe I should be making lots of slides for them to look at, um, but I can't have a lesson where they're making the slides. I could have a lesson where they're using Desmos because that actually, a lot of the things in Desmos are mobile friendly. Um, so it, it, it's sort of, it is a very thoughtful process. And I think that's what we wanted to emphasize today so much is that so much of this is a reflective, you know, reflecting on your own practices, your own routines. You have this, right? You've been doing this, but you now are looking at slightly new ways of doing things or finding places where this can come in as an improvement to what you were doing before. Um, and I'll also say that I'm always here. So you have my email address uh, in the slides and I can put it in the chat too. I'm always really excited to talk to people about what their struggles are. The links uh, technology list is another place to go with any kind of question because there's you know, that, a couple of thousand people on that list. And if you go to the links technology discussion group and you say, I am interested in doing this thing, but I don't know what tool I should use, you will get some recommendations there. So there, there are a couple of places you can definitely go to get help once you know what it is you want to solve. Uh, so that would be my, my soapbox about not the tool first, but the tool as an answer to your problem. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Thank you. All right, no more questions or no other questions. So I'll just uh, wrap things up by saying uh, thank you everyone for attending. We'll send out a recording, the slide deck, the certificate for attending uh, next week.
look in your email for that. And uh, everybody have a great rest of the day and rest of the weekend.